Hello and welcome to Experimenta Social. I'm Nikki Pastore, the um, exhibition and program producer here at Experimenta. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the Wondry people of the Wukulon Nation on which I now live and work. And I um, encourage everyone that's watching today to also submit their acknowledgement of country via our live chat as we'd love to hear um, from where you're watching. Some quick uh, online housekeeping. Uh, each speaker today will present for 20 minutes followed by a Q&A. So if you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A function or the chat function and we'll answer them at the end. Uh, if you're experiencing any tech issues, we're also live streaming via our YouTube channel and we'd love to hear from you at the end. So please fill out our audience survey. This is our last event of the year. Um, so we'll be back early next year and sign up to our e-news to find out about future programs. I'd now like to pass it on to Jonathan Parsons, Experimental Artistic Director. Uh, thanks, Nikki. Uh, welcome everyone to Experimental Social Distancing, number 39, um, Art and Robotics. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution is upon us as we witness the increasing uptake of robotics and AI in many parts of our lives. In this, our last experimental social event for the year, we're going to hear from two artists who are ahead of this transformational curve, having worked with robotics and AI in their artistic practices for many decades. Both artists primarily work within the field of social robotics, a multidisciplinary branch of robotics research that emerged in the 1990s and focuses on robotic systems that explicitly engage on the social level. Through their respective interdisciplinary practices, Louis-Philippe Demers and Mari Velonaki bring a deep questioning approach to the rapid technological changes we are all experiencing. And first up, we're gonna hear from Mari Velonaki. She's a professor of social robotics and the founder and director of the Creative Robotics Lab at the University of New South Wales. Her approach to social robotics has been strongly informed um, by aesthetic and design principles that stem from the theory and practice of interactive media art. I'm now going to hand over the screen, uh, screen to Mari uh, and uh, looking forward to hear from you. Hello. Can you see me and hear me? Silence. Okay. So it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to be even online, uh, part of an experimental event and the same event with, uh, with uh, my wonderful uh, good friend and colleague, Louis Philippe. Uh, today I'm, I'm, I'm presenting from the National Facility from Human Robot Interaction Research. And this is the other space I kind of founded and, and direct. And it's not a background, as Louis Philippe asked me before, the crazy yellow room is just a state-of-the-art uh, testing, uh, testing facility, but we'll move into this a bit later. When Jonathan asked me to present today, I, I told him that if it's going to be another keynote, I'm not doing it. But, but, but he said, actually, it could be, it's an experimental event, so it's you talking like an artist. So it's, 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 it's good for me to revisit where I started and why I'm doing the kind of work I'm doing and why social robotics today it's more relevant than ever for media artists. So um, it, it's from me to the field. And I'm going to this share screen. I also said that I'm very analog. I like screwdrivers and how to build things. I'm horrible for, with my technology. My team here thinks I'm absolutely ridiculous that I need to navigate to uh, start. Uh, OK, share, share screen. Share, message. Am I sharing? Sorry. Yeah. I don't know that I'm on. Sorry. Okay. Your screen sharing. So, uh, cultural robotics. Before we move to social cultural robotics, uh, this is this is the first uh, work that inspired me and was kind of 
seminal for me and 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 how i started working with uh, responsive agents and um and uh, robotic systems. It, it was, uh, I was an art student. It was the auspicious year 1996. And uh, as part of my work, uh, I started uh, the first uh, speech, uh, one of the first uh, speech interactive insta installations were 96, 97. So I was, I was really out there, not. Uh, I, I remember I used a, a, a software called Digital Dreams. And in that installation, you would enter a room and uh, you would see the projection of, uh, of uh, that, exactly that image projected uh, of a woman uh, seated on a red armchair, um, an identical red armchair with a microphone adjacent to it would be in the space and the spectator slash participants would sit and, and use uh, from a light box different command words to form sentences like uh, dance, shrink, die, laugh. Uh, to try to activate the woman on the screen. Uh, that was my data approach back then to uh, to digital uh, to digital uh, projected characters because I didn't believe that much interactivity. Doesn't matter how, what you would do or say, the woman would would respond, but you'll never get to see her face. The reason I present this work is not because I think it's amazing, but but what happened at that moment? I realized that people would spend more and more time in the room. Um, the first exhibition was at Art Space down at Wulumulu in Sydney, and the, the artistic director back then, uh, Nick, Nicholas Tutas, asked me, uh, do you have any hidden pornographic material in there? Uh, because everyone spent so much time in the room, it was one participant per time. Uh, no, it was, uh, so to me, I started using uh, some sort of a, a genre Baudrillard's theory of the uh, cinematographic apparatus and some sort of connection about uh, that kind of, of uh, projected, uh, how we identify and connect with that kind of projected imagery, these characters, that it's, it's, it's beyond uh, uh, genre, genre. And it's really, it's, it's, about, uh, it's about trying to control something other and yet similar to us. This is not relevant to robotics, but so many years later, I'm still, I started building robots in 2003 and designing robots. And still for me, it was moving from the digital projected to a kinetic character, but again, the otherness and trying to connect and understand this space between a kinetic character and ourselves, what a robot represents. It's something I haven't figured out, but I'm still fascinated. Uh, my first work uh, in 2003 was the Fishbird series. Today I'm going to show you only two works and um, unfortunately my new, um, I have 17 works in total but purely robotic. Uh, it's the Fishbird series in Diamandini. Uh, my new robot that was scheduled to be uh, launched in the Tokyo Olympics in 2020 unfortunately um, cancelled because of, of COVID. So yes, th there was a good reason for the cancellations but hopefully next year I would love to present my new robotic system. So back to cultural robotics. The year is 2003 and we have two kinds of robots like uh, we're talking about mainstream robotics. We're not talking about the amazing work that Louis Philippe is doing or performative robots. We're talking about what you could see. It was either uh, 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 the robots or uh, and to give credit, the first work I developed was part of the new segment of Australia's Institute of Robots at the Press Lab I worked in, uh, at the University of Sydney. And the challenge was how to make uh, two robots that they don't look like robots, that are very involved, uh, and there is a question of the and for themselves, as an answer to the the fish bird is based on a love story, it's my favorite love story. It's about the fish and the bird, they love and they cannot bring together the technical But they've somehow learned to coexist and, uh, you know, work it out. Well, the two modes of communication that I've used is really share the same space of movement and printed text. So they have these small thermal printers and this, uh, have, we developed two different handwritings for them, for fish and bird, uh, and they they send these messages to, to the people uh, visiting the space. For the ones that are not familiar, um, fish bird, the vocabulary comes from love letters uh, donated to the project uh, over a period of three years, sex composed by myself, a lot of poetry by my favorite uh, poet, Anna Kintova, I'm not Russian, by the way, but I'm only Russian, I love her work. Uh, news, every time you see them in a different country, you can actually see them in a different country, 
Sorry, it's hard to hear you with the audio playing. Oh, oh, oh. Stop video. Oh. I wait. And I'll stop the audio. Thank you. So uh, how, how much did you hear? Maybe half. So where was the last, where, where, where did I stop? <laughs> I can't remember, maybe stop. <laughs> okay, so, so I was talking about uh, how, how they were writing and the vocabulary. Yes. Yeah, okay, so, so that it was donations. Uh, I, I, it was text composed by myself, donation by people around the world. They were sending the kind of love letters, um, poetry, Poetry by Anna Kmatova and uh, and also fifteen percent ability to form their own uh, sentences uh, by using words from different tabs. And people always used to ask me questions like, uh, you know, why only fifteen? And uh, and to me, I wanted it was important. Something would like to test. Something I wanted to test was to introduce poetic language and and this kind of intimate. Uh, you know, um, messages into the into into the work. So I didn't want to end it up like uh, like concrete uh, concrete poetry. So it was again introducing to robotics this uh, this kind of uh, of uh, dialogue and vocabulary. Now, also people ask me why wheelchairs, and other than than the reason that I didn't want something anthropomorphic or something cute like a, um, a zoomorphic uh, uh, robot. Uh, the reason it, 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 it is designed, we designed them and built them based on an impression of a wheelchair because the wheelchair was, was, um, uh, is an assistive, the first assistive object that, uh, that was uh, created by the Assyrians to, to support the human body uh, to achieve tasks um, that otherwise couldn't, like movement. Uh, it's the first kinetic object. So for me, it was the ultimate kinetic object because a wheelchair, there's something about a wheelchair that always suggests the presence or the absence of a, of a person. But also in this work, it acted like, a, like an avatar for this, this virtual kind of creatures, characters. So the wheelchair somehow enable their story to, to be told. Um, and also the wheelchairs that don't have uh, 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 sex uh, or... or uh, you know, genre or gender or, um, um, you know, um, social class or accent. Uh, so, so, so there was something, something nice. Uh, and also because it's, uh, it's, it's a very strict uh, utilitarian, uh, utilitarian uh, assistive object. So, so I like the challenge appearance versus behavior. With robots, the difference with robots to other artworks is the more uh, the more you uh, work with them, uh, the more they learn in terms of AI. Unless they're performative objects that they have a very specific task, and I have objects like that or many responsive objects that it's fine for me when they're in exhibition, we show them. When when they're not, we stop. But but something that it's it's designed to learn, and I'm not trying to anthropomorphize the the robot there. Learn as a machine. Let's be realistic. Uh, it's good to see different variations. So fish bread, they're still uh, in exhibition um, 17 years later, and also the uh, we developed the biggest data collection in the world in terms of human robot interaction in cultural spaces outside of labs. I wanted to show even a few years later something that changed within the, their behavior. Uh, Thank you. 
So in uh, uh, the reason I saw you the last, the, the kind of the next version of Fish Bird is it's, it's uh, that kind of robotic awareness for the small things, the small movements, the, uh, it, it, for us, the hardest thing is not the spectacular things, but the smaller things that I find very hard. How, you know, control, uh, being being aware with the sensors and, and make real time decisions that they're timely. Uh, that, that's something that's something that uh, that uh, we we kind of myself and my team, we always try to achieve like that kind of uh, real timeness for the next generation of generation of robotics. Uh, and again, uh, with fish bread, what, what we've discovered was like uh, in terms of appearance and behavior, the actual behavior was much more important than appearance. And I'll reconnect towards my end of the presentation. Now in the lab and, uh, and myself, I, I work with the first geminoid robot, the, uh, something that it's not, it's Hiroshi Siguro's work, but I worked with Hiroshi Siguro in 2006. And we did this project with the first uh, Android ever, that's Hatli. The first one, and uh, and to me, I, I I did the work the woman and the snowman, and it was like romancing the machine on the uh, when I went to work with Ripley and Hiroshi, uh, I realized that that uh, that she couldn't move and was only the upper body. And to me, um, what uh, what we work on, we work on together on different sleeping sequences, the sleeping robot. Uh, there was something very poetic uh, about this specific robot in terms of when, when you turn her off, she closes her eyes and then, then, then kind of exhales the air because she runs on pneumatics. And also the idea of fragility that she couldn't go anywhere. I don't know if you're familiar uh, with the work, but it was part of Isaiah. In the lab, um, we test robots that are not ours, it's not robots that we make ourselves. This looks right, like a plea, but it's not a plea. It's again by Hiroshi Siguro, um, a collaboration uh, also with uh, is the Geminoid F, the first Geminoid has a male and female version. And we did uh, a co collaboration with uh, uh, the professor we have in residence, uh, my very good collaborator, Katsumi Watanabe. Uh, and uh, we did this experimental, uh, uh, research, uh, experimental evaluation about uh, how people perceive an Android robot in Australia and Japan. And I was wrong about all of my uh, assumptions that they, the Australian people are not or never going to like it. So actually, uh, what we discovered is that the Japanese, uh, the Japanese people trusted more the system, but the Australian people find it more entertaining. So I was wrong. Talking about uh, about uh, after fish bird, I'm gonna show you these two samples. The other one is the Amandini, which is morphology of a humanoid robot. That was part of my uh, Queen Elizabeth II fellowship that I had to design a robot that was a, a, a stop presentation, a robot that it was uh, a humanoid. And you'll see Yamandini coming a little bit slowly. I hope if it crashes, I'm sorry. I don't know that uh, you can see her there. Yeah. So it was a very big challenge for me. It was a very big challenge because I've proven, I think, I, I thought I'd proven that the behavior is more important than appearance. Uh, but, but then I wanted to take the challenge for an alternative aesthetic of, uh, of an Android, a humanoid robot that looks more like a sculpture. Um, and it was a project that originally we wanted to, to test at the Victoria and Albert Museum in England at the Renaissance and Medieval and Renaissance Gallery. And it was quite interesting in that context, but, but very different for people to respond. So to me, today, uh, it's still, it's still, uh, Yamandini maintains more like a performative object than an interactive object. Yes, you can interact with her within double quotes, but I still think uh, I still think the non-representational forms in in social robotics it would be my preference, and uh, uh, and some of the things that we find out about Fishbird is not how they looked; it's it's the story, something about the narrative. Um, so yes. But anyway, I thought I should show you Yamandini. We still work with Yamandini as a platform uh, to develop um, personalized soundscapes for robotics together with uh, Frederic, uh, what's Frederic's Robinson. name? Robinson, yes, Frederic Robinson, uh, who's a very talented young um, uh, sound artist and researcher. Uh, 
Uh, and now after all this introduction, I just, a long introduction, I think it's probably how much I have, a few minutes left. Uh, I wanna say a few things about social robotics. Like I started social robotics in Australia in 2003, the first center in 2003, when around the world people were asking outside the arts, I'm not talking about people like Louis Philippe or, or other colleagues within the media arts, uh, robotics arts group, but uh, when you would go to a conference to talk about social robotics, I was the entertainment act, right? I was the, the you know, the artist working in robotics or working with roboticists in a non-art center. Um, and I used to joke when they asked me what social robotics, I used to joke and say, well, the robots are on six o'clock, they have martinis and gossip and, you know, talk politics. And I'm really happy to see that now I'm not exotic anymore. I mean, in my field, it's it's kind of like <laughs> social robotics almost become mainstream. It's the biggest uh, biggest kind of industry in terms of investment in robotics, with Elon Musk and many companies behind from Google investing nonstop, a dedicated journal um, for social robotics, and in all major also journals in HRI having this kind of very very strong social HRI um, you know presence. Uh, but what I've discovered, I mean, yes, I've done a lot of museums and our robots visit museums every year and we have all this and it's wonderful, collect that outside of laboratories, it's fantastic. But also we started to do works with industry for non-art things and, and different kind of industry, especially in Japan and, and the US. Uh, and what I discover is a huge gap outside of the arts, robotics and arts, uh, to a point of naivety, naivety of how people outside of our field perceive interaction, interaction with robots. And somehow I feel more and more polemical, not about my work, but my field, not in robotics, but media artists, art and design, what we can contribute. And this is something that it's not about, we're not the politically correct card. Now we make it interesting because it looks different or we shouldn't be the people that we go there towards the end. Um, Interaction art and media art and, and performance media art and performance and technology, all this, like we have a very long history that hasn't been acknowledged out, outside of the art and design scene. And I think as, as more and more developments happening in social robotics, and we talk about the next generation of robots that is not gonna be the robot in the lab or little Sony robot or Pepper. We're talking about investments that will be really, you know, embedded within a societal structure. And I think we have to have the saying when, when it comes to experience, because before, even before I was born and, and I'm middle aged, you know, that's a long time ago and a stupid notification on the screen. Yeah. Uh, so many from kinetics culture, like there's a long history of that only, only our field, you know, understands and uh, of, of people, technology, people, machine spaces and how these things, uh, you know, connect together. And I feel that this, this has, hasn't been acknowledged. And I think there's so, much, uh, there's so much we can contribute and we should contribute because the kind of robots, and I don't suggest for, for a second that you have something like Piamandini, which was a prototype sculpture about you know, new aesthetics in, in human or should, should run around a nursing home, uh, or this is what you should have in an airport. But, but uh, we have a very different understanding and sensibility based on a, a very long history of how, what happens in experiential design, what happens when we share spaces. Um, and the last year, what was positively surprising, like through the lab and through the National Facility for Human Robot uh, Interaction Research, which is this new space, it's a bit of advertisement, but I think it's great because it still belongs uh, to, to a university and not to industry, although industry works with us. Uh, and it still gives you um, a space like this space, it's 220 something hi uh, hidden, sensors that in real time we can get um, uh, complex data that they make sense. That's the difference about human effect and intent or empower robots with multi-sensory ability and very, very quick process to do a little bit of predictive studies about the future. Now, in a multidisciplinary team within academia and hopefully with other, with other colleagues from different institutions from around the world, what can we do? It's not, it's not about promoting robots but it's about questioning, critiquing, understanding. In the human-robot analogy, what I find really, really challenging is, is people. 
it's not the robots. This is the most challenging part. We, we are unique, we're unpredictable, uh, and we get bored very easily. So, so I'm really looking forward to a more critical approach towards robotics. I'm looking forward that more people will have a say in the actual development from the arts, from art and design around the world. Uh, there will be main players in this kind of development. And um, I would like to finish here and, uh, you know, uh, give the, uh, the remaining time to a man who needs no introduction, I agree, Philippe Vermeer. And I'll go. Thanks so much, Mari. That was fantastic. And um, now I'm going to uh, do a brief introduction to Louis-Philippe uh, Demers, who's a multidisciplinary artist um, who uses hybrid and transdisciplinary approaches in his work. He's created over 375 machines, and these works can be found in theatres, museums and festivals across the globe. Uh, Louis-Philippe recently completed a practice-based PhD exploring issues about machines as performers and he's speaking to us from Singapore, where he's the Associate uh, Professor at Nanyang Technological University School of Art, Design and Media. Louis-Philippe, I'll hand over the screen to you. Thank you so much. You can hear me, I guess, now. Um, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Experimenta, uh, Nikki, to host me, give me the chance to um, present my work and especially present in the context and uh, doing it with um, Mary and seeing like the great uh, facility and uh, I'll take it from there and then try to resonate a bit to what um, she was uh, presenting. So uh, without further ado, I will just go to my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, am I filling the screen with my I think that should be okay. Yeah, looks uh, good. That's good, perfect. Okay, the idea is like uh, the title of my talk is Experiencing Alterity. And you can probably substitute it for other titles like uh, because the idea of having a robot, a robot is some kind of an uncomfortable double of ourselves, uh, not a perfect uh, copy. That's not very important, but there's a lot of things about uh, something which seems to be apparently alive or self-governing and so forth that is creating an uncomfortable context or scenario. So basically, uh, most of my work that I'm doing is about humans and then using uh, machines as a dialogue, some kind of a perverted mirror action. And uh, just to quote uh, Baudrillard in a, like a postmodern version of it is like, when the double manifests itself, it signifies imminent death. So if we think about the fourth industrial revolution and all this context, that's very, uh, it kind of sets the tone. Let me just go back to my timer so I don't go overboard. So I've been staging a lot of, let's say either you can see it as confrontation between men and machine, uh, but at the same time, it's a complementarity. Uh, and most of the, work is I'm staging in a kind of a micro universe or micro situation. So it's all about putting you or a public facing objects that are behaving in certain ways. But there's a lot of particularity about a robot. Mary touched base on a few about those, but I just, I cannot stress. The most important part is that robots are co-present in our life. So we share the same space. It's not virtual, it's very analog. Uh, a robot can actually kill you if it, uh, it's a big industrial thing. But at the same time, we obey the same kind of uh, physical law and so forth. So there's a whole set of perception that when you, an object moves, we attribute to it. Think about it as the alterity that we have with animals. It's, it's very similar. There's no way we can understand what's happening in the brain of an animal. And there's basically no way we understand what's happening in the brain of an AI agent, which is running on a robot. So all of this, it's all about giving you an experience that uh, probably you see it on TV or in the newscast. So, what I try to do is to get robots to be very close contact with you and challenge your perception or 
transform maybe uh, the way you see it, not necessarily to like love the robot after, but just to reconsider perhaps yourself at the end in this whole uh, scenario. I'm just going to do a little uh, little theory for uh, <laughs> a few slides, but because they're, they're really beautiful, Jessica Riskin really coined the um, the uh, a very pivotal moment, let's say, in the development of robotics. So, like in 18th century, on this thing is called the defecating duck. So, there's something that we always want to reproduce nature with a mechanistic way, and we want to simulate it. Like these days, obviously with AI, but it's been there forever with mechanics and all kinds of uh, uh, figures and, and so forth. But at the same time, we, we just don't want to be fully reproductible. You know, there's something that says, okay, life conscious, don't touch this, cannot be re-simulated and so forth. So that is a, a contention point because what happens is every time we reformulate through science and through uh, like the epistemological moment of our life, we the boundary between uh, the artificial and, and the organic is always like blurring in a, in a, in a ways that makes this situation uncomfortable for us. Another example, like the, the, the one before is very organic. So it's quite strange that a, a big contention was about uh, looking at the generating excrements in a machine. So it's very biological, but at the same time, there was the AI of the time, the, the deep blue chess player, which was a hoax, but at the same time, people believe that this machine was playing chess and it's a theatrical setup. And, and this is basically what I'm doing in a lot of the robots because the robots I'm building are, are they're not made with, the, let's say the support that you would have like in the scientific field, they're made with love and, um, the idea is like, I have to rely on the context that I create around it to make the agent believable and then therefore questioning like a, a human robot scenario. And at the same time, uh, when we come to in consciences and so forth, you know, like there's our soul is supposedly driving us in, in movement, but at the same time, you know, like if you look at the machine, uh, when it's moving on its own, where is the self-driving element of this uh, device? So is it coming from inside? Is it an external force? Uh, we can ask these questions about everything that surrounds us. And uh, finally, uh, the, the representation of machine throughout history, like uh, robotic art is like uh, thousands of years old, like, uh, there's always a representation of an artificial being, uh, mechanical or not, that is basically uh, summarize the, the conception of us in the universe and understanding our body. So like, you know, before it was clay, then uh, in the 1700s, uh, there was like clock mechanism and then, you know, early century, like a steam industrial revolution and then the 60s, 70s, computers, cybernetics, and so forth. So every time it's a reflection of the epistemological uh, state of ourselves. And finally, like this is a quite important uh, for me, it's a quote by Stoddard is the idea is like the act of doing something creates it. So the act produced the actor, the reflection, the reflected and so forth. So basically when you have the agent moving in the front of you, it's just become the object doing it. So you, you automatically transcend to um, this scenario. So all of this is like, when you think about a robot, a robot is not so interesting on its own. It has to have a, a situation or a niche, you know, like, uh, like us, we're made to walk on our feet uh, in the environment. We're not very good in the, in the ocean and in the water uh, or if it's a social robotics, you know, it will be like somebody like a receptionist or it could be very specific, very important that is embodied, that is in um, sharing or it's a, it's a common uh, universe. And above and beyond is like, it's all about behavior and perception. Uh, you have something that moves in front of you. And then of course, uh, what, the object is doing and what you perceive of the object is two different levels. And this is usually what I play with in all the levels. 
So uh, for instance, I did work, early works was about robot misery. So we created scenarios where uh, the robot supposedly are afflicted with pain. So it's obviously the robots are not in pain, but it was enough make believe in a scenario that people engage and have empathy towards these uh, movable mechanical structure. And you got different stills from the environment. And then what happens is like when we perceive object, if you have three scenarios, you have different scenarios here, let's say this thing is moving towards the ball and there's an obstacle, no obstacle. So if you just look at the last image, if you would see this thing jumping for no reason, because here there's a reason to do something, here there's no reason, so it's all about perception. And we're very good at putting narrative on everything that moves. And when there's no reason to do it, it's even go further. So I play with all these elements. And I can play this just for a few seconds. And if you can understand what's there, probably not. I can play it again. This is somebody walking. If you put your head upside down, you will see it. Uh, all of this to say that we perceive the world standing on our feet. So our perception is really biased of us standing up. You see this in, in modern dance, which was like, you know, uh, a conversation with all the dance that was always upward from the ballet and so forth. So like it's, it's, uh, it's quite interesting that we have to always think that we perceive the world through our body, through all like own bearings. And this becomes really important in fooling the people into different uh, scenarios. So I'm gonna put very short excerpts of different works and try to extract very quickly uh, which one um, uh, salient points on each one of those. Uh, they all like on, on Vimeo. So if you wanna look at it further, uh, more details, um, it's all like easily accessible. Uh, the Taylor girls are quite interesting, especially for the industrial revolution. Uh, this is even before this, uh, uh, Krasauer wrote a beautiful essay on, on them about the, the mass ornament. Uh, what happened is the, the, the Tiller girls, if you look at them, they, they're very mechanical. This is like group behavior and so forth. So there's, there's a whole discussion about having uh, dancers who behave mechanically. So I went the other way. I took a little robot, I'll describe it later, that I stage as the Tiller girls and the, a bunch of small autonomous robots. I just play a little bit of it. Just bouncing around the video. So the, the beauty in this uh, machine here is that use the sound of this thing, is this object is made to study gates, and you see it has a lot of uh, uh, oomph, a bit of flare, the way it moves and so forth, but this robot has no intelligence uh, in the brain way. There's no nervous system. There's no, there's not even any feedback. This behaves by construction. So there's a whole series of modern AI that looks at morphological computing and how they could behave just by construction. And this is very interesting So to do it through nature. So this was done in an AI lab in, the, in Zurich uh, with Rolf Pfeiffer. And then I decided to uh, make a bunch of those to uh, wireless and so forth and make them dance and behave and then put them into the Tiller Girls scenario. But furthermore, if I just do my one little slide of uh, scientific result is uh, try to understand why people find these robots interesting in terms of behavior or organic moves. So I did a lot of like perception of biological motion and I find out in the result that if I give you some cues that this little robot here has some resemblance, let's say this is your waist, this is your shoulder and so forth, there is enough that you would recognize this object among others. So uh, a bit mirror neuron kind of surfing of the ideas to say like, if you have, if you look at an object moving and if you can map some of your own biological feature or understanding of motion to another object, then this 
channel of connection is enough to further the empathy towards the object. Uh, the blind robot is a very different way. Like the other one is totally like, um, let's say the AI is based on the construction. In this case, the AI is based on the scenario. The blind robot is uh, inspired by uh, the work of Melo Ponty about phenomenology, about the, the blind person as the cane, as the extension of the body and so forth. But the cane does more than this. The cane just tags you as blind. So in this case, I wanted to push it further. Uh, so I took a normal, just uh, arms of a robot, very anthropomorphic uh, construction. I stage it. So when you go there, you're in the front of the robot and the, the robot basically touches you uh, as what people would consider would be what a blind person would be doing, which is yet another stereotype. And then you're invited to be touched. So um, what is uh, fascinating with this uh, work is the moment before or after you get touched is very different. People are quite afraid before because you've never been touched probably by a robot. You could be afraid and then after when you get, let's say, uh, when you get to know that the robot won't necessarily hit you or is quite gentle and so forth, then you engage and you start uh, having a more open dialogue. Um, this is a video shot in uh, Moscow and um, in an art show, so there's uh, the translation is underneath, but I think the, they summarize quite a lot of uh, the reaction from the people playing with the agent. So the soundtrack is not so important, just look at the visual. Как это делают слепые? Сможете ли вы довериться машине? Какие эмоции при этом испытаете? Это партиципативное произведение, в котором зритель и его реакция на такое художественное исследование телесного интеллекта и проблемы embodiment на стыке робототехники и социального моделирования. Художник испытывает пределы возможностей человеческого взаимодействия с машинным разумом. So uh, this robot is a direct implementation of the chess player. I'll leave it with this and plays a lot with stereotypes in, in the context. Um, but the, the idea is like when you present an object to you and you say, okay, this is a blind robot, you start believing that this object has a goal or an effect and so forth. And I tried to verify this with a series of experiments. So I set up the blind robot in a lab with a lot of motion tracking to collect data. Um, and basically I did uh, a very simple experience uh, with, the, with the target group, with two different target groups. One target group, I said, the robot, this is a medical device. It wants to gather, gather data about you, whatever telemetric information. And then the other one, I, I said, like, uh, this is the blind robot. It wants to touch you and to know you. And I was measuring the response to the different people. And then, um, and the, basically the same movement. And uh, we all inclined to believe, of course, that the people will prefer to be touched by the blind robot uh, because the idea is they understand why is there the motion. In the other case, they, they don't really, uh, they know it's very mechanical function and, and so forth. So uh, my point being in there is like the intelligence of this robot, the competence of this robot lies in his name doesn't lie in his technology. It lies only by the fact that you're sitting in the fact of a blind robot. So instead of writing uh, millions line of codes and do machine learning, I just call it the proper name. And then suddenly I believe into the agent. That's the takeaway uh, thing that I tell the engineers all the time. By the way, I'm an engineer by formation as well, uh, software, but uh, this is in my youth, not right now. <laughs> and of course, you know, the, uh, this has been uh, but the fourth industrial revolution being a bit recycled. Uh, these are images that goes into the Associated Press, so you have no control over it, but it's kind of fun that they, they put this in this context. It was kind of makes me grin when I see these results. And then when we shift to Inferno uh, with my colleague, Bill Vaughan, uh, we been, did a lot of robots before, and then we, we did quite a few stage pieces. And the one I showed at the beginning with the 
Australian Dance Theatre on the stage. Uh, we wanted to bring the experience close as possible, like I did with a blind robot right before. But so we wanted to do a performance where we would just actually uh, get as close as possible to the people, of course, without altering their bodies too much. So we decided to do a piece with the exoskeletons. Uh, exoskeletons are really timely as well, especially in the age right now with telepresence, uh, uh, with COVID, that's uh, a big ticket item. At the time, we, and you know, this has been uh, very popular, like you have Walt Disney with his puppet manipulation. Uh, this is actually from an art um, expo fair where you can manipulate uh, radioactive material. They invite you to play with the tele manipulator. So it's all, it's, the zeitgeist of exoskeleton has always been there. It's nothing new. It is just that they become more and more present, uh, especially through Hollywood. Uh, exoskeleton like this does nothing, just visual. But at the same time, I think the year we started the um, um, uh, Inferno in 2015, I think there was two or three Hollywood movies using exoskeleton. So I said, oh, we hit the button. Uh, and then this is Bill and I uh, controlling people in the, um, the performance. So we do a bit of puppet mastery with, um, so it touches many, many different layers that I won't necessarily go into it, but uh, let's play it a little bit. So you get a feeling of what it is. Or maybe I'll just show you a bit more stills before. Uh, Inferno, the idea is like when we started this, we started from a place in Singapore called Harpar Villa. This is a depiction of hell. So Inferno, again, is a bit like the blind robot. It's just a name to set your uh, believability into the objects that's going to happen there. So if it's Inferno, you imagine that this is full of, you know, it's, in, it's hell, it's fire whatsoever. And this is people before the performance. So when they start, they're a bit scared. They don't know what's going to happen. They've never been moved by an exoskeleton and they got, they're being strapped. There's a whole ritual of doing this. But at the same time, uh, people are more laughing. So what, ha what we realized that after the initial moment, then after it becomes some kind of, uh, you know, rich, modern rituals of playing with machines and being inside the machine. And, and when the people let themselves go, with the machine, when they give them to the machine, they have a much better experience through it. So I'll just play it a little bit. I see I'm running out of time. Let me go a little bit here. So you get a bit of a feeling. <laughs> A lot of the manipulation is done live. So for us, it's really, we're performing with the people. We're a bit kind of, you know, ro robot DJs and uh, uh, sound DJ throughout the evening. And then just to show you two words very briefly uh, to conclude, we did some uh, scientific measurement as well to see how much the exoskeleton feel and how people describe the experience with each other. But, um, when I read scientific papers and out there. Uh, and then uh, the, the last two works, which touches, uh, like this is an ongoing project, which is based on, uh, I can play it in the background, it's low noise. Uh, the title is inspired by uh, Joseph Boyce uh, when he played uh, with um, Little John, uh, I like America, America likes me. So this is uh, an old creation, uh, I manufacture a series of robots that are more feral. Like in this case, this is a drone that actually just wants to crash on you. So the person in there is being constantly like challenged by the, by the drone. Uh, normally this work is presented in a pure pitch black. So you don't see the drone except uh, even the LEDs would be covered. So the idea is like to put you on the level ground with the animal. So it's basically like going to a cave and then uh, I have sensors on the person, so the animal knows if you're afraid of, uh, of it and so forth. So I did, I'm doing a series of scenarios where 
the technology is, uh, let's say, more deranging, a little bit more annoying, and it's, uh, you know, the reflection on all these objects, like drones, for instance, are really annoying, not only at the noise level, but as a presence um, in the society, and I'm talking about when they're useful to deliver, like, let's say, medical supplies and back in the back country, but it's very different scenarios. And then finally, to be uh, very timely, um, I did a piece which is called Repeat. Uh, I used uh, industrial exoskeletons, so I bought it from the industry and I put those onto dancers. And the idea is to repeat uh, some of the dance work done by uh, classic moments. So, but moreover, the, the point is they are like workers in a warehouse moving cardboard boxes. I won't name names of company, but uh, especially when COVID hits, these companies are making more money than ever. And this is, let's say, the beautiful future of augmented human bodies. Because if I, on one side, the human body is like if I give you an exoskeleton, you might not wreck your back as fast as possible, so you become more productive, more effective. Uh, but at the same time, like the, the real question is like, why do you have to move cardboard boxes to start with? Uh, you know, so, uh, and the whole idea is the whole piece is half an hour of you watching this monotonous life unfolding in the front of your eyes. Just play it a little bit. Yeah, I think I just, while it's playing in the background, just a little bit more. So you see a bit of the, the feeling for it. So it was quite intriguing that it was right, maybe six months before uh, these uh, shipping companies started to do. And choreographically, it's a big study about how to if you're still able to develop a vocabulary with very constrained movement, because these exoskeletons are uh, more limiting than uh, anything else. So thank you so much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Louis Philippe. Um, I, might, I might ask um, Mari to come back as well and um, see if we have um, any questions in the in the little bit of time that we have remaining from our audiences? This is your chance. Just type into the virtual uh, chat, um, and I'll just see if something comes up there. <coughs> While people are thinking about that, I'm just interested because um, you know when you both started with your practice, social robotics, um, you know, in terms of. Uh, I guess the general public's experience of social robotics was was extremely limited. Whereas now, you know, uh, people are becoming more and more familiar with that form of robotics in public space. So, have the questions for you um, that you can ask through your art practice, and indeed uh, the questions that art could pose uh, around social robotics, changed given people's increased familiarity with robotics? So, you're Murray, you've got, you've, you've got your microphone off. Yes. <laughs> no, no, you've got it off. No, the question was, do you want, yeah, both of us. Yeah, both of them. It's a question to both of you. Yeah, yeah it has changed. It has changed. Uh, it has changed not much, I, I, but it has changed not, not uh, in terms of an art audience, because art audience, they, they, they have, uh, it wasn't so much about social robots, but I think at least when they see my work, the gallery work, not the industry work, the museum work is, uh, it, it's, it's some sort of kinetic sculpture. So it doesn't matter. And I always try my pieces to make them look not so much technological, which is a hard thing, hiding the technology, stringing things. So, but uh, the changes with, not with the art crowd, but with the kind of different, uh, different industries, different areas, when someone comes to the lab, what expects to see. Um, yeah, yeah. And Louis also with the press, the media, how the media pose questions. I think they, they, I think these days they sound more sci-fi than before. Yeah, 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 okay. 
yeah, uh, for you? It's, it's, it's intriguing because a lot of, um, if I go back to something that I read about um, Bartnik, which is a, he's, he's a very prominent social roboticist, uh, doing a lot of psychological uh, evaluation. So he, he just put a book out about social robotics and he, he, his own comments is like his obturies about social robots because most of these robots are already so much past that they, they don't make any sense anymore. So it's quite intriguing that social robotics is um, it's very much shifting in terms of what it should be doing. But at the same time, the roots should be always the same. Uh, and the, the, the problem, it's not a problem, is like, you know, when, when you look about how you can bootstrap uh, uh, scientific knowledge, you know, like you, you cannot just jump in and have like, a, um, try to analyze something between a super complex elements. So they start with something very simple, you know, it's a bit like when they do robot, they make them play like a football game and things like this, which is very arbitrary problem. And then what happened with social robotics when you confine them to certain roles, like let's say like a receptionist or like all these things, they're so stereotype of gender, of function and so forth. And like, you know, there's always like the caregivers are always stereotype as well. So that kind of failed because the scenario is not quite, it's like they think there's a market, but they don't really know how to do it. Uh, if you have a chance, look at the, there's competition of robot try to fold um, um, a blanket or a towel. Right. It's really hard. It's tough. <laughs> so they cannot do this. So like, like, you know, like there's so many little tasks, we, we multitask and, and we try to, and, and I think the big difference is, um, you know, like we are historical beasts. So it's very important. Now we can start doing this with machine more and more, but we, we have like all our life of learning and plus what we can take in. And what they do with social robot is an assemblage of different elements. So a bit of vision, a bit of speech to text, a bit of this, so it, it's clunky. It cannot be, it's not embedded. It cannot be yeah. embedded because we're, we're online 24 seven for so long. So to compete with this, it gives something different. So I think in, usually instead of fighting this scenario, you should give in and try to find ways where it's really working well uh, with you. Like, you know, there, there's a lot of silly things that I see with social robot, you know, like, uh, you know, but at the same time, it's a business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a, a, some, a couple of questions coming up about how, um, the notion of social has changed drastically now with the COVID uh, pandemic. How um, do you think this impact um, will impact on the, on the future of your work? And this is to both of you. I mean, for me, for sure, like a lot of the performance are is highly compromised right now. Like, you know, a, a blind robot, for instance, these days would be a, I would have to uh, have somebody to do cleanup of the fingers, uh, every visitor and things like this. So like, you know, that, that, that things that you could dodge before, <laughs> now you have to uh, de de deal with it. Uh, but at the same time, Inferno does social distancing because we have to prevent people to hit each other. So, <laughs> but the, uh, it creates this scenario, but at the same time, like if you look at social robotics at large, uh, you know, like the, um, especially for caregivers and th things like this, like the, um, the, they made studies, for instance, like people are, are, are more ready to be washed by a robot than by a caregiver because yeah. it's anonymous. Yeah. So yeah. Imagine you have your purely safe object that treats with you. I would say, yeah, there could be chances. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's an incline, but it's, I just don't know how we adapt to a lot of things that are presented to us. Like it's already like um, we, you know, I always show this as us being slaves to the machine. So like it's really quick to get into uh, be imposed by a system. So uh, I think that what Mary said before, it's important that we step in and uh, be able to, you know, give a little bit of input about uh, 
please don't do these uh, these things because that's not what we want you know uh, especially when you look at design of objects and uh, what they are and uh, what they represent it's quite uh, scary yeah Murray, has it has it changed for you the impact of COVID? Uh, yes, uh, one to be to be brutally honest, it's uh, there, there was uh, financially uh, most of the seventy percent of our projects are funded uh, from overseas organisations and thirty percent in Australia. So at the moment, for example, a project with Japan, uh, it's not a virtual project. Project is a real robot that needs to be built in Osaka, and there were delays and our collaboration with Yokohama. Uh, there are things that you need to test with people because as a little lips, they're physical things, they share space, it's not a little digital, uh, nothing against little <laughs> digital avatars, but you know what I mean, you build something to, to be implemented in a, in a physical space. So yes, the positive, there was a positive as well. Uh, I think uh, social robots, not only what we did, but social robots, because it's a very, very big field in terms of diversity. Uh, with the COVID, uh, people hopefully realize or that, that uh, we have many, 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 many useless robots. So, uh, so there's gonna be a kind of reinvestment, maybe redistribution of, uh, sorry, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, kind of research and development R&D because, uh, because there was so much time spent of how do we build a robot that does something other person is doing, which is such a waste of time, you know? This kind of replication is a bad replica versus how do we design something? How do we create something that enhances something that the person is doing? Mm -hmm. so, so I think to me, this is something like, honestly, there's so much research in social robotics. Yes, there's some interesting uh, things that you can see. Uh, of course, art doesn't need justification and the import of, of culture, right? I'm not talking about that, that, that uh, area of social robotics, but if you think that people spend billions right, in, in social robotics, robots for home, robots for nursing homes, robots for receptionists, why and how? I mean, uh, can I say it, social robotics as a field, it's really a baby that is not able to crawl yet. Uh, there are so many big questions about size, about morphology, about behavior, about movement, about situational context. Most importantly, no one has long-term interaction data, including ourselves that I like always say, you know what? Yes, I have almost 700,000 something from museums. Mm -hmm. Can I say something means nothing, nothing. For long-term interaction, I'm irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, when we talk about real systems that they all share, coexist, evolve, they need to learn, they need to be resilient. And most, most importantly, they need to be more than gadgets or some sort of an experiment, unless it's an artwork that they have their own, you know, space to exist. But, but the way they perceive, I think we need to reevaluate and be, maybe this is an opportunity to be really, really honest and critical. Uh, and it has to be multidisciplinary from the start, art and design, ethics, social sciences, AI, I mean, uh, you know, our Bartnek was, was a very important colleague and researcher, but if you look at the publications, it's yet most researchers, doesn't matter how amazing they are, they get access to small toy robots or videos, or um, I, I honestly think that you cannot talk about issues like trust, intimacy, um, with something that you can pick up and throw it out of the window in two seconds, you know, comfort zones. That's why I say there's a lot of things to learn from, from artists, from media artists, from performance artists, from, uh, I think we need to concentrate more on the experience versus uh, replication. Yeah, yeah, now there's an interesting uh, comment and question from one of the audience members um, are saying, um, you know, do you have thoughts about food automation robots and the difference it makes if someone cooks for you with love and if it's fully automated? And you're touching on a lot of these, uh, many of the kinds of issues that they, we've got so much uh, more to learn, really, in terms of, uh, of where we're going. Look, we're right out of time. There's been a lot, there are lots of questions, but mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave it now. Um, uh, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, you. It's a really fascinating area. And, uh, and as you say, just learning to crawl. So let's hope we see many more artists working in this space to, 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 to help us get through adolescence to adulthood. Thank you to both of you.
Thank see you, you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Nikki Bye -bye. and Jonathan. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah. Bye -bye.